Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome Dr. Carter to our session today. I chance to run into him on Twitter, which I refuse to call X. Perhaps XX is uh, more appropriate. He started the Climate Emergency Institute in 2009 after hearing Dr. James Hansen's 2008 statement about a planetary emergency. Uh, he's been working for the IPCC. He's uh, turned his attention to uh, what we could call health protection policy. Uh, he's got interest in sustainable development, climate change, biodiversity. In particular, I've been following what he's been saying on Twitter regarding methane and tipping points, should be of interest to everybody on the call today. Uh, I would label him as a science communicator. Uh, in his view, climate change is a human health issue, a human survival issue, and much more. Uh, I think this is evidenced by the publication yesterday in the Lancet of their annual review of the risks to human health from climate change. And I look forward very much to hearing what uh, Dr. Carter has to tell us about the global climate emergency. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um... 2009, of course, is an awful long time ago, and here we are, but um, uh, the climate change um, uh, awareness by the world and the decision to um, respond to it is, is so long ago. It's now 30 years since the 1992 um, United Nations Climate Change Convention was signed, which is, by the way, an excellent convention. It's a pretty strong convention. Um, but here we are, we um, are now um, looking at our 28th annual um, United Nations uh, Climate Conference, which is going to be at the United Arab Emirates. And um, matters could not be worse. I'm afraid my, my theme has become, because I monitor all the, uh, what are called the climate change indicators, which NASA provides, uh, Copernicus in Europe provides, NOAA. So um, uh, people have for a long time found climate change um, not an easy thing to understand, although it should be easier with all the extreme weather events, of course, we've got coming on now. But uh, the communicating the science, the, the science tends to be presented in, um, uh, in, in a very difficult way way for people to understand even myself it takes a long time so this is what i've been trying to do i've been trying to uh, uh, put things into um, uh, short form and uh, redo graphs and images and things like that and uh, try and get people to understand really what's going on so with regards to the monitors we've been in the the indicators we've been in a situation now in which um, my message i'm afraid is that everything is getting worse and everything is getting worse faster and um, so uh, I'm, I would call our uh, emergency situation, um, uh, at the very least, an intensifying emergency. Um, we should be aware of that with all the extreme weather events. And um, thank you for asking me, because I can explain my ideas on what must be done. Um, clearly, what's happening uh, at the moment um, is, is being done in the wrong kind of way. Um, I'll start with a little uh, odd bit of good news, though. Um, with respect to this um, conference that's coming up, I went over all the documents uh, quite recently. And actually, for the first time ever, all the parties to the conference, um, uh, all the institutions, organizations, but all of the um, uh, um, the countries, the EU, and yet, they, they have all now, uh, for the first time, agreed to acknowledge everything that the IPCC that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has been saying, particularly in respect to what has to be done. So that's somewhat of a breakthrough. Um, it's actually a big breakthrough. But of course, um, uh, the governments and uh, corporations have all kinds of ways of uh, skirting around and not doing what they have to do. And, and so th this is uh, your three wise monkeys, um, uh, see no evil, uh, hear no evil, speak no evil. And this, I'm afraid, is rather the response that we're getting increasingly as uh, as things get worse. Um, uh, the other extremely odd thing, which is a form of denial, is that um, the uh, the danger limit, and it's a disastrous danger limit um, of 1.5 degrees C of global warming, um, uh, which 
resulted really from the 2018 uh, 1.5 degree C IPCC report, which is a really good report. So now, so now at least we know we're in emergency. And now at least all of the uh, parties, um, uh, all of the countries, um, have acknowledged that, yes, what the IPC is uh, saying is right. Because um, for many years, of course, they've been fighting the IPCC and disputing the facts that the IPCC has been putting out. So we're in this dire emergency. The emergency is getting worse. And um, uh, 1.5 degrees C is actually a globally disastrous danger limit. That was very obvious with the 2018 report from the IPCC. And 2 degrees C is globally catastrophic. So um, uh, um, if you bear with consider those numbers, um, it will help as we go through here. So the, 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 the best accurate in all kinds of ways analogy to the situation we're in is, um, uh, is the Titanic. The sinking of the Titanic is um, a, a perfect analogy because um, the climate system has, uh, the main characteristic of the climate system is it has huge inertia and therefore huge momentum. And you remember that uh, when the iceberg was spotted, um, everything was done, including the engines put in reverse. I will explain that we don't have engines to put in reverse with the climate system, although some people uh, like to think we do. Uh, it was too late and the uh, great ship struck the iceberg and then it took hours and hours and hours to sink. I won't go into the analogy uh, anymore. Um, can't read it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, um, uh, um, there's a quote which I wanted to share with you from uh, 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 from the presentation. So NOAA, which is the United States National Ocean and Atmospheric um, Association, um, uh, I took a quote from their most recent. Uh, they do this on an annual basis. They do a report called the Power of Greenhouse Gases. And uh, this occasion, and these are conservative scientists, um, they made the statement that we are committing earth and ourselves to climate chaos for thousands of years it, it, that's a little bit um similar to the uh, recent paper that james hansen and colleagues put on as well they were looking at um both of these um uh, uh, both of these articles both of these papers were looking at the uh great system inertia and also looking at the um huge feedbacks um which are ignored so one of my um, favorite topics, I suppose I have to call it that, are the feedbacks, uh, the, res the response of the planet to global warming. Um, one, of, uh, one of the really bad things about the IPCC um, uh, is that uh, they continue to exclude um, the extra warming, which will be a lot from the feedbacks as the global warming increases as you'll know from the media now, it is an increasing very fast. So this, these are quotes from the um, IPCC assessment. The sixth assessment uh, came out in 21 and uh, it came out in 2021 or the year before in 2020. And um, this is a press release from uh, the 2022 second working group report, which is on impacts. And um, so I'm going to read this to you because this is most, most important coming from the IPCC, even more conservative. This report is a dire warning about the consequences of inaction. And that's where we are. We are in inaction uh, as the, wor the world is facing multiple unavoidable climate hazards over the next two days with global warming of 1.5 degrees C. So um, everybody pretty well is pretending that we can still uh, limit the warming to, to the globally disastrous 1.5 C. But here we have the IPCC actually saying and acknowledging that we're going to be there. And they said we would be there in the early 2030s or so around 2030. So we're just years away. Um, the last quote I've got here is that any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. 
that um, uh, um, term livable future coming from the IPCC, um, that uh, is a wake up call and a shocker if ever there was one. And um, so I'm trying to. So um, I'm going to start here with the um, um, uh, first thing that everything is getting worse faster. So this is the, the most important of the uh, climate change indicators because this is global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this image is taken from the um, most recent, uh, just publicized a month ago, um, European source of the, um, of the emissions. It's called EDGAR. And as you can see, um, uh, in 2002, uh, the rate of global greenhouse gas emissions increased quite a lot. You'll see that little notch right at the top there. That's the COVID dip and the COVID rebound. Um, uh, the virus pandemic put us into a sharp decline. Uh, governments poured money um, for a recovery of the economy. And most of that money was poured into uh, the fossil fuel industry. And so we see emissions going So um, we had a record increase um, uh, of 6.2% increase in the past two years. Uh, these are emissions too. Um, uh, these are the global fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions. And um, uh, this was just recently uh, published uh, that this year, 2023, will be another record high. Sorry. Um, uh, um, a record high in carbon dioxide uh, uh, emissions. And um, so I, I have to speed up, I'm, I'm sorry. So this is the famous, uh, infamous uh, record October uh, temperature increase. And it was um, uh, an October temperature increase of 1.7 degrees C, um, which is absolutely extraordinary, um, boosted somewhat by El Nino. But this is the, uh, this is the biggest um, warming in a month. The um, hottest month ever was this July in 2023. And that was the hottest by 1.5 degrees C. But this October was hottest by even more, 1.7 degrees C. Um, I want to show you this slide because this is uh, this shows acceleration in no uncertain terms. Everything, in fact, is accelerating, all of the indicators that I follow. But this is an uh, interestingly important one. This is atmospheric heat. So this is the heat which causes the global surface warming, which is accelerating. And you can see very, very clearly, this is dramatic acceleration in the heat in the lower atmosphere, which is in turn warming the surface of the planet. So here's a, um, a, here's a representation of uh, global warming, global surface warming. Um, this, uh, the source of this is an excellent source. It's um, uh, a team out of the UK led by um, uh, scientists in Leeds. And uh, they are going to do an update of the climate change indicators every year because the IPC report comes out only every five or six years. So um, you'll see here the temperature just shooting up. And the uh, quote from this one is that uh, the last 10 years, the uh, rate of increase of global surface warming was unprecedented. So again, the temperature increase is getting worse and it's getting worse faster. So very, the very, very important um, uh, facts for us to be aware of is that um, uh, the summer of this year, 2023, is a record summer ever on record. Now, the summers, of course, and I, I, this is one thing I do with the communication, we're given global surface warming. That's the, um, uh, that's the result of which we're always given. But we really need to be given the summertime global warming. Um, because, of course, that's when we get our heat waves, that was, that's when we get our forest fires and our droughts. So summer this year was a big record global warming. There's a, a map in which you see all the uh, deep red areas of uh, everywhere which is affected by unprecedented uh, global surface warming. 
which we tend to call global surface heating now. So this is from NASA. This shows the summertime and it shows the uh, how it uh, jumps right up in the past uh, year, 18 months. It's a very dramatic image. Um, so this year to date um, was 1.3, 1.43 C degrees C. And so the climate centers are saying that there's a 90% chance um, we're going to be at 1.5 degrees C by the end of this year. So I just want to remind that 1.5 degrees C is a globally disastrous temperature increase. It's not just a number. The number represents um, unprecedented in our history, uh, human suffering all around the planet. I'm going to show you in a, in a minute what's happening in, in Brazil and South America, for example. So um, uh, that's 1.43 degrees C. Um, this is an image from Berkeley Earth uh, projecting this 90% chance that we will not only be at a record temperature increase this year, 23, but we will be at 1.5 degrees C. So you may have heard in the um, uh, in the media that the uh, scientists um, at Copernicus, that's the main, that's the EU NASA, if I can put it like that, um, uh, they got the results of the temperature increases out early. And they said that uh, this year will not only be a record, but it will be the hottest year in 125,000 years. Um, this image is from the IPCC sixth assessment, and it shows you why they know that. Because in the sixth assessment, and uh, you're looking at 10,000 years of temperature now. And that's really important because not only is that the civilization period, but it's the period of a really um, unusually stable climate in which uh, we were able to uh, develop our greatest invention ever, which, of course, is agriculture. Uh, but this greatest invention ever is now under threat by increasing extreme weather events. So the uh, quote here is that uh, from the IPCC, is that global surface temperatures are more likely than not unprecedented in the past 125,000 years. So this is um, uh, every month we're getting um, hor horrific reports from some region of the world and the all big regions that is getting hit. Um, uh, it's like a the uh, the climate. Uh, system disruption that we're causing. It's like the earth being in a punching bag. Um, uh, we're having these unprecedented extreme events like everywhere, uh, right across the Northern hemisphere in particular. So th this is the latest one. Um, this is South America. Uh, South America for the past two, three months has been getting record high temperatures. Um, and that is temperatures in the range of a heat wave in their wintertime. They're in their springtime now. And uh, you can see these temperatures are completely out of sight, totally unprecedented. You've probably heard reports of what's happening to the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest is within this extreme heat and is also suffering from extreme drought. And um, uh, it's a terrible, terrible situation from the point of view of all those people that live there, but also from the point of view of the planet and our future because it, uh, if we lose the Amazon, and right now we are losing the Amazon because of what you see before you. The, um, uh, the um, uh, two of the slides are from uh, Climate Reanalyzer, and the other side uh, slide is, is just from the UK. So you see one slide in degree C, black as black could be, and the other slide, the temperature goes white when it goes higher, and they are experiencing temperatures in uh, Brazil right now, are in excess of 50 degrees C. So everything is um, going completely horribly crazy and it's getting worse um, all the time. There are 100 million people in, uh, in Brazil under a high dangerous heat, 100 million people. Uh, you remember that um, this summer there was a not dissimilar situation in the United States, um, uh, terrible, terrible heat. Um, uh, particularly in the southwestern United States, but tracking right up the middle of the states and right up to Canada and causing our record forest fires in Canada. So um, you will likely also have heard of this because this is the sea surface temperature. The sea surface temperature um, since June has been uh, phenomenally high. 
um, uh, North Atlantic um, uh, was completely out of sight. Um, unreal uh, surface temperatures around the United Kingdom, you'll probably remember. So uh, this is from NOA again, and um, we are in a situation of record marine heat waves. 30% of the oceans are now under marine heat waves. That's a big, big record. And this is lasting. This has been going on since June. This is the uh, Hansen, uh, James Hansen paper, the recent one. Um, uh, um, there were about eight authors in this paper. In this paper, he um, uh, in this report rather, this is this is a newsletter. But he was joined in this report by two of the world's leading uh, earth energy imbalance experts, because James Hansen has been trying to get across the importance of earth energy imbalance as long as I can remember. So um, the media said that we are warming faster than we had anticipated and thought. Um, climate change surface temperature has been accelerating, as you can see from that graph. It has been accelerating for the past 10, 15 years. Um, now, um, James Hansen is warning us that this acceleration will continue and it will get faster. Um, the, the two reasons for that um, uh, are emissions, um, uh, as you saw on the slide just a couple of few slides ago. Um, we are emitting uh, greenhouse gases faster, more than we ever have. And the other thing is that we're having some uh, improvement in uh, pollution, particularly from ships that are um, improving the amount of sulfur that they're emitting. And um, this is a big problem it was recognized long, long ago that um, uh, the air pollution acid aerosols are a cooling effect. And so um, uh, we are, we're getting an extra uh, kick in the uh, global heating with regards to that. But we will be at 1.5 degrees C um, uh, you will hear over and over and over uh, in COP28, it's all about 1.5 degrees C. We will be there around 2030, and our governments and everybody are denying it. So there's no preparation for this juggernaut, which is going to hit us in just a matter of years. Um, uh, and that is bad, bad, bad. Now, the other thing um, in this uh, paper by uh, or this newsletter, and it, James Hans has been putting out this for a year now, is that we have a lot of heat in, in the pipeline. So our surface temperature last year was 1.2 degrees C. It's going to be 1.5 degrees C this year. Uh, but that does not give us a, a hard fix on uh, how much of a temperature increase are we committed to even if we do the right things. And we've got nearly two degrees C in the pipe, 1.8 degrees C to be precise. So um, uh, we, um, we are looking at um, three degrees C of um, practically unavoidable temperature increase, and that is absolutely disastrous. So this is from another uh, recent paper, a famous paper um, published by Bill Ripple um, uh, out of the um, Oregon State University. And um, his paper was called uh, 2023 State of the Climate Report, Entering Uncharted Territory. Um, well, that's probably quite a good way of saying that we're in a no analog state. The state of the planet has never been anything like it's been now. So the, our emissions, primarily from the fossil fuel industry, have us on a living on a completely different planet now and a planet which will be getting more and more chaotic and insecure as the years go on. So these are the three main greenhouse gases, atmospheric CO2, methane, blue nitrous oxide in the, in the tan color. They're all accelerating. Um, uh, and this is coming out year after year from the reports that we're getting from NOAA and from NASA um, uh, that when they uh, put these out, um, every year they say um, they're accelerating. And that is absolutely insane, crazy. That's the nicest way I can put it. So uh, there are um, uh, these indicators from the Ripple paper. You can see surface temperature clearly accelerating. Ocean heat, of course, is absolutely skyrocketing. Uh, most of the uh, heat from our added greenhouse gases 
to the lower atmosphere goes into the ocean because the planet is mainly ocean. 99% of the living space is, is ocean here. So that, that heat from greenhouse gases goes straight into the ocean. And um, uh, it's now at a phenomenal rate. Um, the people, the physicists that are able to work this out, um, this is uh, heat which is going into the ocean at the rate of at least exploding 10 Hiroshima bombs every second. It's a massive, massive amount of energy and heat which we are dumping in the ocean with our constant, not only a constant greenhouse gases, but our constantly increasing greenhouse gas emissions. So the one in yellow there is the Earth energy imbalance. Um, uh, the, uh, this is a big shocker because the scientists have been grappling with this for many years. Um, uh, in the past year or two, they've got a really good fix on it with um, all their satellites and uh, and um, ocean uh, Argo floats that they're using. And uh, we, they found that uh, the Earth energy imbalance um, doubled in the past 10 years. So the energy imbalance is excess energy, which we put into the climate system, um, uh, primarily in the, um, uh, in, in the oceans, as I say. But that is also driving, the heat in the oceans is also driving uh, in big part, the global surface warming now. Um, this is a slide of atmospheric um, carbon dioxide concentration. And uh, very, very, very clearly, you can see that this is accelerating right from the uh, first date in 1958, right up to the present time, October. And um, uh, um, the uh, the concentration is now 422.17. Um, uh, that's um, terrible. Uh, the uh, last increase in the last month was three parts per, per million. There's a record increase in a month's year end. So we are all the time getting more records, and they're records in the wrong direction. They're records that point to a uh, disastrous, catastrophic global situation for the entire world if we cannot wake up our uh, leaders um, uh, to act on the emergency because, of course, they're doing exactly the opposite. They're encouraging, subsidizing more fossil fuels, pushing more fossil fuel exploration. So you can see that the fossil fuel trend is the one in red there. So you can see that's accelerating as well. Um, this um, shows the um, abrupt increase in atmospheric CO2 because it really is abrupt. Um, this uh, this um, image is from Berkeley Earth, and this shows the past 10,000 years. On the horizontal there, the pale green, you'll see that it's pretty regular. It doesn't change that much. And then all of a sudden, with fossil fuel industrialization, it shoots up, literally shoots up. So it's very important to people get this idea um, uh, over a 10,000-year period. Because the uh, slides that I've just shown you from 1950, 60 do doesn't really give you the sense of how fast we are pushing up the uh, atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. Um, uh, so atmospheric CO2 is increasing uh, faster than ever. Um, uh, it's increasing um, 100 times faster than the normal slow increase that gets us out of uh, ice ages and into warm periods. But uh, the IPC6 assessment uh, said that the rate of atmospheric CO2 increase. Now, atmospheric CO2 increase is causing, of course, the majority of the global heating, but it's causing all, it's causing all of the ocean acidification which is a disastrous catastrophic situation in its own right. We are in a planetary emergency alone because of the rate of uh, ocean acidification. So the IPC told us that we are now putting CO2 in the atmosphere four to five times faster than during the record of the past six, 56 million years. So the scientists go back 56 million years and the rate of CO2 increase is faster than that. The rate of ocean acidification is faster than it's been in the past 300 million years. And the oceans have been acidified an extra 30% at least um, by this extra carbon dioxide and the accelerating soaring carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. But here is the very worst um, uh, uh, new 
scientific news and new scientific finding. And uh, many of us that have uh, been involved in trying to communicate the uh, emerging climate situation and the, the situation of the emergency, which we're now in, which we anticipate and try to prevent, um, our worst nightmare has always been methane feedback. And we are now into a methane feedback situation. So this is a completely different situation which, with regards to climate emergency than we've been in up to this time. Um, because this is a planet Earth destroying situation. Um, the scientists are onto this and they have found that methane is increasing faster than it ever has, particularly over the past three years. It's, it's increased by what you'd have to call an explosive rate of increase. And uh, they have determined that this is due to feedback emissions from uh, wetlands. Now, wetlands over the years with the science have been uh, sort of not covered very well, um, but they are a huge, huge source of carbon. And that is now pouring out of the wetlands and pouring out of the wetlands all over the world. The tropical wetlands, of course, are hot already, but the northern wetlands, of course, have been heated up and they're pouring out. Uh, um, uh, uh, this is another big surprise to the scientists the amount of methane that's coming out of the wetlands, not permafrost, coming out of the wetlands very, very, very fast. Um, the um, atmospheric methane concentration is, is, has increased now uh, 266%. Um, when I was showing you the atmospheric CO2, CO2 has increased um, more than 50% now. It's up to 51, 52. But uh, methane, atmospheric methane, has increased by a factor of 2.66. Um, crazy, crazy, crazy. And the big jump in the past few years that you can see on that trace is due to feedback emissions. Now, this is a slide that I had to dig out. Uh, this goes back to 2006. And uh, because this uh, shows the situation with regards to methane feedback, um, the permafrost and, and uh, peat-rich wetlands are mixed up in the uh, far north of Canada and, and Russia and Scandinavia. So you, you'll see that brown is the peatlands, there's a vast, vast amount of peatlands um, uh, and huge stores of um, uh, carbon in those. And there are the numbers there. And the peatland is approaching the amount of carbon that's in the permafrost. Um, uh, and uh, the amount of carbon in the permafrost is double that in the atmosphere. So um, uh, we're into feedback now. Um, uh, this is a map from uh, NASA, and uh, it's, um, uh, it's from their satellites. Their satellites are so clever now, it's amazing. And this is showing the wetlands. You can see we have vast wetlands all over the planet. Um, uh, the Hudson, uh, Hudson Bay lowlands in Canada is one of the very largest wetlands. It's been pouring out methane this year. Um, there's another huge one up in the Siberian lowlands, um, which you can see up there. But there are large peat-rich wetlands in the Amazon, in Africa, a huge one in the, in the Sud um, of East Africa. My time's up. Um, this is the um, highest uh, methane uh, level on the planet. And this is from uh, northern Saskatchewan. And um, it's on the border of the vast Canadian wetlands. And methane here has reached over 2,000 parts per million. Its pre-industrial level was 722, so you see, I mean, it's just absurd. It's crazy. And But you can see in 2019, 2020, how that methane has just shot up, right? That's dire, dire, dire planet Earth emergency. So now um, I'm going to move to, um, to solutions. So um, the situation that we're in is that we have um, so much uh, atmospheric uh, concentration is so much higher, it's at unprecedented levels, that we're carrying this huge, huge amount of inertia in the climate system. 
as the oceans are getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And the Titanic is the very best analogy, and I won't say anything more about it. Um, uh, we have a lot of inertia in the system. And um, uh, this slide comes from uh, the late Michael Raupach. Um, we, we've got delays in recognizing climate change. We're not really recognizing a climate emergency yet. Then we have delays in negotiations. Then we have built-in delays on uh, deploying the technologies worldwide that we need to deploy. Because um, one thing that has, um, has been realized and all the parties to the convention now are accepting the fact that fossil fuels have to be phased out. Now, that's a huge change because for the past uh, 25 years, um, uh, world powers have been trying to persuade us that fossil fuels don't have to be phased out. We have no future unless we uh, have no fossil fuels. So we have to replace fossil fuels, as the environmental community has been telling us for decades, 100% with all of our great clean renewable energy technologies. But on top of that, we then have the inertia of the land and the ocean, which is massive. And then we have amplifying feedbacks, which the IPCC ignores. But that's an inertia. That's a commitment for future warming. Um, there is a um, uh, there is a lag in the uh, in the oceans, as I say. Um, the scientists are coming up with some uh, um, uh, uh, models which uh, give the impression that there isn't. So this is from the sixth assessment of the IPCC. Uh, simply what it says is that when we, whenever we do, when our leaders say, okay, we're mitigating, we're changing our policies, we're going uh, we're going to mitigate strongly, right? Then it takes a few decades for us to see any change in the temperature increase. So once we start strong, strong mitigation, we've got decades before we see the temperature respond. And for the uh, temperature to uh, start declining wouldn't happen until uh, 2070, uh, according to this. I'll skip over this. That's the domino effect of all the climate feedbacks. Um, so... Um, the IPCC reports for many, many years have told us that we have to put emissions into decline by 2020 for the 1.5 degree C limit, but also from the previous uh, catastrophic 2 degree C limit. This is not getting out there at all. Nobody is putting this out there. Um, I've been trying to do this for years and years and years. 2020 is the absolute longest that we have known we could possibly leave it before we put emissions into rapid decline. This is a uh, this is an image of a mitigation uh, mitigation of greenhouse gases uh, from the fifth assessment in 2014. Uh, immediate um, a large rapid increase 2070 continued up to near zero um, emissions. So this is the other thing that isn't being getting out there, that we have to get to near zero. Now, um, the IPCC ha has told us that we have to put emissions into decline on an immediate basis. Um, this is in the report, but as I say, it, it's just not getting out there. Um, uh, this is a, a quote from the IPCC chair, for Sang Lee at the 2019 uh, Madrid uh, conference, in which he said emissions had to be put into rapid decline on an immediate basis. Here he is at the two years later at the Glasgow conference, telling the world that global warming of 1.5 degrees C and 2 degrees C will be exceeded unless immediate, rapid, and large scale reductions of greenhouse gases occur, particularly carbon dioxide and methane. So our emissions should have been in the de decline now, 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 now. Um, uh, this is showing that they had to decline in, by 2020. This is a graph of emissions from the UN Climate Secretariat. And um, uh, that's from the uh, 2018 1.5 assessment that I've mentioned, emissions going to rapid decline 2020. This is the best report that we get, actually, um, the uh, 
UNEP and IHD and others have been putting out this report, which they call the, the uh, gap, uh, the uh, production gap report. So this is where they work out for us what the governments are planning to do with regards to fossil fuel production. Um, uh, and they are literally um, uh, um, putting the world on a death sentence. What you see there, that red line is a climate change death sentence. And there, there's no other way of putting it because they are going to continue um, uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases and they're going to continue increasing them and um, uh, the IPCC says that it's actually worse than this. It, the, the IPCC 6 assessment said that right now, what they call a constant emissions, so the current policies um, uh, commit us to a uh, end of the earth uh, warming of 3.2 degrees C. So yet again, you can see on this, which has only been published a couple of weeks ago, it's 2020 when the emissions decline both for 1.5 and 2 degrees C. Um, this is from the International Energy Agency. This, this is a plan. We've had very few plans even of uh, mitigation. They put this out in 2021. You'll see that no new unabated coal plants, which means no new coal plants. Um, China's building coal plants as fast as it ever has right now. Um, but you'll see also, they say, no new oil and gas fields approved for development. This is from the International Energy Agency. And they say no new coal mines. But we have um, every country, um, Europe a bit better than the other countries, but every country is, is allowing more projects to be opened up. Massive projects for extraction of greenhouse gases. Um, particularly uh, natural gas in Canada. Natural gas, of course, I, I think the message has got out there that natural gas is practically as worse as coal because it emits CO2 and it's burnt less, but uh, natural gas is mainly methane. So the God knows how many thousands of miles, millions of miles of pipeline that's been put in now, um, unavoidably they leak methane. So uh, natural gas is really actually the worst fossil fuel there is next to coal, um, because it, it emits methane as well as CO2. Um, this is the solution. Um, uh, this is from Mark Jacobson at Stanford, and um, he's worked it out, and he keeps on reworking it out. Uh, we don't need to burn anything. No burning. The burning age is over. Uh, we have enough renewable, and we've known this for many, many years. We have more than enough renewable energy to provide all the energy the world needs with clean, renewable wind, water, and sun. So we need to burn nothing at all. Um, uh, the, um, the solution really um, uh, to have a solution of 100% um, clean energy and also to have a solution for the other greenhouse gases, particularly methane, the solution is conversion. It's not a question of improvement or less emissions or, or less uh, methane being emitted by uh, the world's cattle. Uh, we have to change everything, and we can. Um, all of our goods and services that we are used to and depended on, they're all emitters. Um, but we have what used to be called alternatives. So there's an alternative for everything that we do um, in which we can live the life that we are used to living and not be emitting greenhouse gases. So energy, we, we know, okay, that's pretty obvious. Um, construction is another one. We cannot continue building everywhere in the world with uh, steel and concrete, nothing's worse. Um, uh, we have engineered wood, we can construct high rises with wood, Agriculture, of course, has to be converted. It's a big source of uh, nitrogen, which is the main source of nitrous oxide emissions. Yes, nitrous oxide is number three uh, after CO2 and methane as regards uh, heating of the planet and the oceans. But nitrous oxide is a tremendously powerful, long-lasting gas. Um, it lasts for hundreds of years, like CO2. 
and it's more than 100 times the power of CO2 for heating. So they all matter. Every single one of them matters. Our diet, of course, we have to change. Um, uh, this is a big, big methane source. Um, uh, we're doing a bit better in North America, but now China is the uh, main uh, source of cattle-based methane, uh, ruminant animals. So we have to convert from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet. We just have to do that because we literally have to stop emitting, right? We cannot continue emitting. And um, uh, we're now well over the 2020 um, um, danger limit in time, which was established by the IPCC, by the way, decades ago. So um, we need what I call world of veganization. Um, but having said all of that, we are not going to survive ourselves. It's completely impossible to mitigate climate change all the time we're killing each other. So it is absolutely essential. And we, mu we must not be separating these things. The wars that are going on, we, um, uh, we're now expending a record $2.24 trillion a year on armaments. And yet our governments tell us they don't have enough money to, um, uh, force, to um, uh, see their obligations of uh, extra funds to the developing most vulnerable countries and they don't have enough money to do what we do we 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 have all the money we need but we're spending it on on making ourselves um fearfully of each other etc so we have this horrible hot war going on in the middle of europe we have again a flare-up in the in the middle east and um uh, So um, what I have in, in, in the book that I co-authored in 2018 called Unprecedented Crime, Game Changers for Survival, in addition to these conversions, uh, we're not going to make it unless the world gets together in an unprecedented degree of cooperation and does this, uh, which is a fastest track possible to develop the technologies which we have and deploy them so that we can make these conversions and we can run the world with uh, goods and services that don't emit greenhouse gases and which make the world a much better and happier place. So I call this Apollo Marshall Manhattan Project. The idea actually goes way back to um, uh, Hans Schellenemurger, who was the late um, chief of the uh, uh, Potsdam Climate Institute. Um, we we have to remove carbon dioxide. Uh, we, it's absolutely essential that we develop a safe and effective technology to remove CO2. We know we can do it in theory, um, but we're nothing like. Um, we're rather like the um, uh, Manhattan horrible project to develop an atomic bomb, right? Um, uh, we've just got the very early stages of knowing that we can reduce it, but we're nowhere near being able to do it. Um, uh, world energy conversion, I've, I've mentioned, but we have to put that on a very, very fast track. We have to uh, look at all our cut cutting edge uh, renewable energy technologies, and we have to deploy them worldwide. We have to rebuild, as I say. Now, uh, James Hansen, in, in his recent paper um, uh, of um, uh, called uh, Global Warming in the Pipe, in, in which, by the way, um, uh, we have 2.4 degrees actually in the pipe. Um, the newsletter said it was 1.3, but it's actually even, uh, it was 1.8, but it's actually even more than that. So uh, James Hansen says that uh, we've no choice now, um, that we have to go in for cooling the planet. Uh, that is an absolutely terrible, terrible juncture. I never imagined in all my uh, years of working on this that I'd ever live to see the time when our scientists were telling us we had to geoengineer. Um, uh, um, I've been working um, with a, a group of people around the world, and we think that what we should do is cool the Arctic and do that first and see what happens then, because that's regional cooling. And we have to cool the Arctic because we have to stabilize the sea ice. We have to stop the sea ice from melting. That's a huge feedback. And we have to stabilize the uh, permafrost and the wetlands. We have to stabilize Arctic carbon. Um, uh, the, um, as the uh, Professor Ewan um, uh, Nesbitt 
in London uh, University has said, um, uh, we are at a uh, juncture in which we could see a rapid, complete turnaround of the climate system because of the rate of methane being emitted from the wetlands. So how do we stop that? Um, well, we we have to cool the, the Arctic. We have to do that. Um, uh, the, uh, we, we're told there's no silver bullet in, in the sense that that's right, but really there is one. And the silver bullet is because our governments are, are doing the most terrible, terrible, wicked, evil thing, which is they're not only subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, they are increasing those subsidies. So the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, this year republished the amount of total subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, and it's now reached seven trillion dollars a year seven trillion dollars a year that has to be stopped the world has to mobilize to stop governments doing that because we have no future all the time they continue doing that already the future for all today's children in the world is is the, the worst um of uh, the worst planet that uh, we've lived on for a hundred thousand years they're looking at a um uh, what the ipcc is called um surviving on an unlivable planet so these have to be forced to stop now um as well as causing planetary catastrophe the fossil fuel emissions burning fossil fuels are killing 10 millions of people a year 10 million people a year from air pollution so this is a very, very wicked, evil thing that the fossil fuel corporations are doing. And our governments are not only allowing, but they're paying them to do with our money. So the other thing that the governments had to have done long ago is to prohibit the banks from financing more fossil fuel extraction. The banks are pouring money into financing these massive new extractions of uh, natural gas and oil. Um, uh, we've got one of the biggest ones in the world in northern British Columbia here. And um, in 2022, the big banks um, uh, uh, financed the fossil fuel industry, more fossil fuels, to almost $670 billion. And they're putting this kind of money into fossil fuel expansion every year. So I'm just going to move on. And my final slide will be to say that, uh, repeat, that we have to have a climate mobilization in response to the climate emergency. And my favorite NGO is an NGO in the United States called the Climate Mobilization. And they have done absolutely fantastic, tremendous work um, uh, um, going from uh, town to town, state to state, and uh, educating the politicians and the policymakers on what we face, how bad the situation is, and what we must have to do about it. Because having said all these things that we must do, all these conversions that we can make, uh, it's not going to happen um, because of our own governments. It's not going to happen unless there is a global citizen mobilization, literally to force the governments to stop pouring money and permits into more global suicidal um, fossil fuel extraction and finance the uh, renewable energy higher and higher and higher. So um, uh, back in 2006, I was reminded that the UK Stern Commission, an excellent report, in his solutions list, he had a uh, public information and persuasion campaign. And um, uh, um, we really, really have to do this. But the ultimate solution is for people to understand how bad the situation is. Because unless people and the leaders understand the terrible state that we're in, uh, we are facing an unlivable future as the ipcc has told us in its most recent assessment so we have to get it across that this isn't just an emergency anymore um, uh, this is the survival of all the human race and most of life and in fact our excellent uh, un secretary general antonio guterres uh, told us that 
in a uh, in a presentation that he gave at a World Austrian Summit in Europe, and he made the statement that climate change is an existential threat to most of life on Earth, and also particularly to the life of humankind. So our UN United Nations chief told us that several years ago now, and he keeps on telling us what we have to do, and our governments keep on making sure that it doesn't happen. So this partnership, this fossil fuel promoting extracting partnership between our governments, the fossil fuel corporations, and the banks, this is a source of unprecedented evil. It's not just a crime anymore. Um, we're looking at our planet being ruined, um, ruined for all the children on the world today. And we, we all love our children. We really all do. But we have to link that with uh, the fact that they have to have a uh, livable planet. They have to have a planet in which they're not exposed to um, extreme heat waves, huge forest fires, droughts over and over and over, um, uh, damaging crops. So um, my final statement will be that we've reached the stage of uh, climate disruption causing damage to the world's crops. Um, Europe has just announced that last year its uh, cereal production um, took a big hit. Um, it went down, quote, sharply. So what I've been saying for many, many years is that uh, the main thing that we have to um, work on and and communicate is that the multiple adverse impacts on our agriculture, because all of these, what we call and our extreme weather events, of course, not only cause us a lot of pain, um, uh, but they damage agriculture. They reduce our food productivity. And um, we are already seeing the IPCC six assessment said that they are beginning to see, the scientists are beginning to see a reduction, a sort of clawback. Uh, our our, our um, agriculture, world agriculture, of course, has been a phenomenal success. Production going up and up and up and up all the time. But it's now slowing down. And I wish I had, been, had the time to send you the update of the um, uh, um, uh, um, limits to growth by Galen Harrington. And um, uh, she updated it and put a bit of greenhouse gas pollution into it. And what she got was that uh, our food production plateaus um, uh, in around 2012. And by 2030, 2035, world food production um, collapses. And that's the end of, uh, that's all I have time to say. But thank you very much for giving me all this time, because usually I only have 10 minutes for the big science conferences and presentations to uh, government committees. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter. That was amazing. Um, I want to encourage everybody to get the opportunity to look at some of the slides that you had to skip over for the sake of time. There certainly appeared to be some really interesting information in there, uh, probably cobbled together from sources that have rarely been brought uh, together at the same table. So please everybody if you get the chance uh, do go in and look at the slides which will be posted on our website along with the recording of the chat i'm going to ask the fir first question and uh, paul beckwith is on deck so my question is this and i as i explained before the meeting started worked on this uh, from essentially the same standpoint for quite a number of years why isn't human health being seen as important enough to bring about the kinds of fundamental change that uh, we are going to be faced with having to undertake. And it's it's getting worse and worse. We need more and more change every year the longer we put this off. Well, that's an excellent and very important question. Um, uh, the medical profession, the health profession, um, has been ahead of anybody else for many, many years in um, uh, explaining and uh, alerting the world to the um, uh, disastrous impacts of health of continuing to burn fossil fuels. But I do agree, um, it's not really very much out there. 
um, uh, the health people, um, uh, health organizations, they go to every COP, every UN climate conference, and they are making progress now in actually getting health for the first time into the UN climate conferences. We have the Lancet, um, you know, the um, uh, timely honored um, uh, um, medical uh, doctor's medical journal in the, in the uh, UK, and they do a uh, health update um, e every year. Um, we also have, you know, uh, with every COP, we've had um, statements around the world from all of the uh, medical journals. They did it again this year and said that at this particular COP28, um, uh, governments must agree to put emissions into decline fast. So they're doing that. Um, but of course, they're trying to get through this massive obstruction that our own governments and our own corporations are, are putting against the information getting through to the public. The corporations don't want this truth, the full truth, to get out to the public. So that's, I think, the main reason, because the health people um, uh, have been doing great, great, great work on this. I mean, all the data is there. You know, um, malaria is going to increase with um, uh, climate change. Um, uh, that took a lot of research and statistics to work out. But you're right, it, it, the connection is not made. Yeah, very much too bad. Uh, we'll keep working on it. Okay, so uh, Mira Lee is on deck, and I'm going to go now to Paul Beckwith. Hey, uh, you know, thank you, Peter. You know, it was a wonderful presentation. I just have a couple uh, burning uh, questions and comments. Um, just to reiterate basically what you're saying, because um, I was fortunate enough to interview uh, James Hansen um, just a couple of days ago about um, global warming in the pipeline and also about his recent letter of November 10th. I'd recommend that everybody just Google James Hansen, go to his Columbia University website. The links to his uh, presentations and stuff is there, and he's he's prolific. Um, he posts many things each month. And um, of course, he's the one who testified in 1988 um, to the, the, the Congress. Um, and he's saying, yeah, I mean, we're probably going to pass two degrees uh, within about 15 years. Um, in about seven years, 1.7 or so degrees Celsius. And I just checked the um, the Goddard Institute of Space Science uh, data, and we're likely to be, 2023 is likely to have a global average temperature of 1.54 degrees Celsius. So, you know, it amazes me. Um, that this COP28 is going to be full of 1.5 alive and things like that. And I'm saying the only way 1.5 is alive is if we change the baseline to uh, 2000 or something. And then we're at 0 0.65 and we have a lot of leeway. I mean, this baseline shift has happened in the past. Um, anyway, these are more comments and agreements. I don't, you know, I just wonderful presentation. I mean, it, it, it's... Uh, you know, fantastic slides and, and you know, the work that you do on raising awareness for climate emergency is, is just phenomenal. And I'm a bit biased. I should point out my bias because Peter and I and a few other people, we do a weekly video on a group called the Climate Emergency Forum. Um, so, you know, Peter and I and others are on a video every week. So I've known Peter for, for many years. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again for, for your presentation. Uh, so, so Paul, yeah, um, uh, and thanks for allowing me to respond because yes, um, 1.5 degrees C um, was impossible years ago. Also two degrees C was impossible years ago. Uh, that's the fact of it. Um, the reason why that isn't gotten out there is um, because it's well known that the IPCC the scientists, the reports they put out are highly conservative, highly conservative. Um, uh, so um, uh, they actually, in 2014, they actually did say at that time that the amount of greenhouse gases that we have in the atmosphere, which determines the future 
uh, surface heating, which we can't avoid the stuff that's in the pipe, as Hansen puts it, um, uh, was two degrees C. The quote was, the um, commitment is, quote, about two degrees C. So the scientists actually were aware of that back in um, uh, 2012, because that was the cutoff date. Um, the Earth energy imbalance um, definitely, definitely says that there's no way that we can hold this to two degrees C. So yeah. um, thank you, because that's the message we have to get out, because yeah. um, uh, that's the only way we're going to have this um, total global cooperation, quit fighting these wars, put the resources into saving our planet and saving ourselves, right? And doing the very best we can for our poor children everywhere who know what they're facing. Um, and and uh, do, you know, a Manhattan Marshall, all resources available, a massive project to try and save the future and save ourselves. Yes. One, one quick addition, very quick, which we haven't really emphasized is the reason for this massive acceleration in temperature that we're seeing right now is not the El Nino, because that's still to be realized in the system. According to Hansen, James Hansen, it's the reduction of sulfur in, in marine shipping fuels by the International Maritime Organization. In 2015, they put regulations on sulfur in shipping fuel. They tightened those regulations in 2020, and he's associating those reductions with reducing aerosols, which they block sunlight and keep it cooler. So without them, there's more solar radiation on the surface of the earth. And also, they, they're crucial. The most crucial thing is the indirect effect of aerosols, which is in clouds. Lots of aerosols, lots of low-lying clouds, very bright, very few, much fewer sulfur aerosols. There's fewer cloud, so there's a lot more solar intensity hitting the Earth, and, and those are the main things. Hansen is attributing the warming. I would like to add that the methane stuff from you and Nes Nisbet, which you talked about, is also key because... The methane rise in the last few years is not from fracking. It's not from fossil fuels. It's actually from the wetlands, mostly in the tropics, also some in the northern boreal um, regions. Uh, but it's mostly um, the expansion of wetlands in the tropics. And the reason we know it's not fracking and fossil fuel emissions is because of the isotope ratio called the, the carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio should be increasing if it's fossil fuels, but it's decreasing the last uh, number of years. And that's got to be a release of methane from microbes in, in wetlands. So it's it's pretty conclusive um, what, what, you know, the picture is very clear. So, so people like Michael Mann, who, you know, I say Hansen is the real man. Uh, because people like Michael Mann are go-to mainstream climate scientists who are always, uh, whenever something on climate occurs, the mainstream media goes and gets quotes from them and interviews them and videos, tapes them. And, uh, you know, he's written a lot of this stuff in his book, but, but that's, he's saying gl climate change is not accelerating right now. And I think, you know, in the next six months to a year, I mean, it's going to be obvious to everybody that this, this is just not the case. So so this is a problem. This is a problem communicating the danger of climate change when you have some of the mainstream people, they're not up to speed with what's going on right now. Okay. Yeah, Paul, I, 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 I do have to admit that that's a problem. Um, uh, the uh, What we politely call understatement or underestimate of the science at this point, at this juncture, yeah, that's a problem, but all we can do is do our best. Now, with yeah. respect to the um, uh, um, big increase, the accelerating increase in both CO2 and, and methane, um, uh, and, and the global temperature, um, you could go to a site, uh, which is um, uh, um, an Oxford University site, and it's called the Global Warming Index. And they take out um, the effects of El Nino, uh, they take out the effects of uh, aerosols, and they give us a, uh, and it's just pretty straight line, they give us um, what the global temperature is doing from our greenhouse gas additions alone. 
And uh, you'll see that that global warming graph um, uh, is increasing at a uh, phenomenally rapid rate. Um, the scientists have not been able to tell us um, how fast the global warming is really increasing. Um, uh, that we know that it's higher than it was in the past 25, 4,000 years. And it's also increasing faster than that period. But it may be increasing faster than it actually ever has on the surface of the planet here. Um, as, as regards the methane increase, yeah, of course, you're absolutely right. And it's totally terrifying. Um, uh, we have now entered the age of carbon feedback. Um, uh, uncontrollable carbon feedback. We've always known this, decades and decades, and um, uh, the IPCC really hasn't included it in its assessments. And so that hasn't really gotten out there either. Um, but um, uh, if you take away that past few years, right, um, uh, you can see that methane is accelerating rapidly. It's much more obvious than even CO2 that methane is accelerating over the past 15 years. And the uh, the reason is because actually all of our human sources of methane are being increased, all of them. Uh, um, uh, the source of uh, waste, the landfills being increased. Um, uh, the cattle, the world cattle herd is increased. Um, uh, that's the other big source of methane. It's been increased. Um, uh, the natural gas industry increased. There's a paper that just came out. Um, uh, two weeks ago, um, which just looked at the uh, fossil fuel source of methane. And it's big. It's really big. And it's coming from the natural gas industry. So um, uh, I, I guess what we have to do is get everybody to focus on methane because it's an end of the world situation. We're increasing all of the sources and we should be converting those to sources that don't emit methane or certainly don't emit anything like this amount of methane. Um, uh, and um, that's why the world needs to go vegan, basically. Um, and um, uh, uh, you and Nesbitt, uh, all I can say is, um, uh, as a scientist at the top um, methane leader in the world, he, he, he really has uh, told us in no uncertain terms how bad this is. Um, but it's our job, I guess, to really get that out there now. So, yeah, it's bad. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of Anders Weichmann, or actually make a comment, after we hear from Mira Lee. So Mira, over to you. You have to unmute. You have to unmute. Good. Did I get, all right. Are you going to read my question or you want me no, to no, ask? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. What? I, I was totally impressed with the piece of information you, you shared, Peter. And it's very scary. And I'm, I'm so disappointed with uh, what we are not doing. My question is that, uh, do you think that net zero targets are any realistic? Are we going to meet those targets by 2050? Are just they're going to be one of those things we set up just for our grandkids to take care of? I have no idea what is happening because I know we are making progress, but is there anybody in the world measuring our success towards the targets just to let us know where we stand? The, am I making any sense? Yeah, the net zero target is is scientifically correct. And um, that's been known for decades. But what's also been known for decades, but recently has been forgotten about in how we are looking at net zero is very different. Um, uh, decades ago, we knew that we had to stop burning fossil fuels because we had to get to as close to zero carbon as is scientifically possible. And the scientists in the past had that worked out to about 90, 95%. So we had to drop our CO2 emissions, and that means our fossil fuel burning, 90, 95%, which of course obviously means we have to end the age of fossil fuels. 
But now we have a big problem with net zero because the scientists and policymakers have introduced the idea that what we need to do is to, and we need to do it, we need to remove some carbon dioxide as well. But they're given the impression that, that we can do that today, and, and we can't. We would need 20 years, 30 years at least, um, uh, under the kind of, um, even if we, you know, we all address um, net zero. And as I say, at least up, the big climate conference coming up, um, everybody now acknowledges um, uh, we have to make net zero, but they're all acknowledging also that we have to phase out fossil fuels. So the fight of ending fossil fuels is beginning to uh, have a result. And that's a struggle that we've been waging for decades. Are we making any progress to net zero? Oh, absolutely not, none whatsoever. Um, because instead of um, uh, putting um, uh, CO2 emissions into rapid decline and therefore uh, closing coal plants, as the International Energy Agency said we have to do. Um, we, are, we have bigger, uh, more expensive fossil fuel extractions than we've ever had. Um, uh, and they're everywhere. They're all over the planet. They're in Africa, they're in China. Of course, they're in Russia. Um, uh, Europe's burning more coal again, um, uh, and um, Canada is um, uh, Canada is a terrible example to the world. Um, we're extracting a significant amount of oil still in Canada. We have the oil sands, which is, um, you know, I mean that that's a that's a that's a stain on the planet. If ever there was one, it's a, it's a horrible industrial project, and our governments are allowing the tar sands to continue with more investment. And then we have this uh, Montney play, um, a sort of what the um, uh, fossil fuel people are calling a, a world play um, of uh, methane by fracking. So um, everything's worse. I got to say, everything is getting worse and getting worse faster. And that particularly applies um, uh, to our energy production because, um, you know, fracking came in and we thought that we were going to be at peak oil, right, 2006. And then the uh, actually the scientists and the, and the governments um, uh, pushed this huge amount of fracking. And um, uh, so we're producing more oil than ever. The United States is producing more oil and gas than ever has, um, uh, more than anywhere in the world. Um, so we have to mobilize. We have to campaign. And we have a problem there because our damn governments are cracking down hard on the brave young climate change protesters. And uh, we all have to get behind them, our generation particularly. It will take a massive, massive, massive campaign to force governments um, uh, to face the situation and do what the IPCC has been telling them for years that they have to do. Uh, this is way more than a crime. Well, I thank, thank you very much for sharing with me, Peter, but I am so disappointed and frustrated that I'm going to leave this world for my grandkids. I'm ashamed of doing this because there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can think of anybody else can do. I don't know if there, is there any solution. There's a lack of leadership and there is the, money is not the only problem. It's the leadership is the biggest problem of this world. And nobody you can ever find that, that is strong enough or capable of enough to lead the process. And we are in a, in a um, just going around and around and around. We are making progress, but can that progress be um, satisfactory? Is, that, is it really can be quantified in the terms that which, you, which will encourage us to keep on doing what we are doing. We are zigzagging. While we are making progress, we are going, some countries are really pulling us back, unbelievably. So I, I don't want to take a lot of your time. I know that we already taken, but I thank you very much for, for your information. And uh, um, I really, really appreciate that. Great, thank you, Mayor. Okay. okay.
Uh, Anders Weichmann actually feels that his question was answered. His observation was about whether the increase in methane was due to fracking. And Peter, he thinks that you answered that question quite well. So what I'm going to do now is Art Hutter is going to be on deck and I'm going to go to Samrat. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for making such a nice, strong presentation. I think you already answered my question, but it's just up there because we're all talking. Uh, my question was like uh, a lot of your uh, presentation was based on the IPCC. Now, since a lot of other worse assessments and worse outcomes are being looked at, would you like to say something about that? A lot of the what, sorry, are being looked at? A lot of worse assessments of the future and worse outcomes have already been published. And those are, how do you say, scientifically based as much as the IPCC is. So in that context, I think while you were talking to Paul, you did say that the IPCC is rather conservative. Uh, yeah, but your, your comment on, on the, on the uh, report um, um, bringing the bad news, we've had some improvement there. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, in um, 2018, I think, um, a, a paper was published by a group of leading scientists called Too Risky to Bet Against. And that's a paper um, uh, really to read. And uh, they made it very, very clear um, that with the uh, tipping points that we're all pushing, um, uh, that we are now in a planetary catastrophic situation. And um, we can't bet on uh, these technologies which is going on. We can't assume, which is being assumed, that um, uh, when things get bad enough, um, we can remove CO2 and so that we can compensate for things. So there are these papers that say, no, 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 no. That's not going to be possible for decades. So we're into a climate catastrophe. We're not into climate change now. We're into climate catastrophe. It's not climate right. change any longer. Um, uh, the Bill Ripple paper, which just came out this year, um, uh, um, which received um, excellent media, and it was an absolutely superb paper. Um, uh, and that paper was called State of the Climate in 2023. Made it very, very clear that we're in a climate catastrophe situ situation. And 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 those authors and um, uh, there were about fifteen authors I think in that paper. They pointed out that it it, it is a, a moral priority uh, for all scientists to start speaking out, and for all scientists to be saying we are in a intensifying, getting worse planetary emergency, and all the scientists need to be telling the governments. This is the science academies, the Royal Society. They need to be telling their governments to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. And actually, this is the mandate of these highly influential, powerful scientific organizations. The national science organizations are mandated to explain and advise their governments on matters of serious public concern. Mm -hmm. but, we're, but with respect to the end of the world, caused by accelerating climate disruption. They haven't done that. If they were to do that, then I think that uh, we could really, everything could really start clicking into place um, because they could persuade uh, the governments that the governments are destroying our future. Okay, thank the you so much. The other paper that uh, yeah. prob probably you were thinking about was um, um, there was a, a new paper on tipping points and that paper pointed out that even at today's temperature, um, we may well have exceeded a couple of the thresholds. We've exceeded the Arctic sea ice, which is the starter of Arctic feedback, methane, CO2 um, domino effect. And we've all also exceeded the Greenland ice sheet. Um, uh, we've also think we've exceeded the um, eventual collapse of the Amazon because the Amazon is not acting as a carbon sink anymore. It's acting as a carbon source. And there's yes. another paper. So so there are at least three very powerful papers that have come out in the past couple of years. Okay, thank you so much for your answer. Yeah. Great, okay. I'm gonna go to Art Hunter and uh, Kent Peacock is gonna be on deck. Yeah. 
Um, I'd like to withdraw my question in the uh, interest of time. Okay, fine. Kent, do uh, are you ready to come online? Sure. Anytime. A right, very simple question. Well, the answer may not be simple. How seriously do you take the risk of so-called methane belch that some people have talked about? Some scientists are very concerned about it. Others think that it's not a serious risk at all. Well, methane, of course, is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. It's 86 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. The scientists keep on telling us that it doesn't last as long. It only lasts 12 years, but that's not the point. It's 66 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. It's being emitted constantly, mm. constantly from yeah. all these human sources. What I'm raising so, is... Um, Sorry, yeah. So I, I, I guess the question is, um, can methane feedback be, be an uncontrollable end-of-the-world situation? And... If, that, if that's the question, definitely, definitely. Well, My God, uh, methane to... is is a is two hundred and sixty six percent higher than it was. We've increased atmospheric methane by two point six six fold, right? And now, on top of that, we're getting a huge amount of methane, and I'm talking a huge amount. Um, uh, the satellites, the European satellites, show it up very, very well now, and it's coming from all the wetlands in the world all of the wetlands in the world. Um, uh, the Hudson Bay lowlands in Canada is still emitting in the uh, end, uh, end of October um, a lot of methane, a lot of methane. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's a planet killer, no question. So so what I was specifically... Oh, and I should add, I should add, I should add, sorry, that there's hardly any coming out of methane hydrate. There is some, okay? But methane hydrate um, is, is not the huge uh, planet destroying source of methane. It's the wetlands because um, uh, as soon as they heat up, they put more methane out. And as long as they're heated, they put more and more methane out. Yeah, I was asking specifically about the risk of methane hydrates on on the continental shelves, particularly in the. Oh, sorry. I, I, I okay. I didn't. I didn't catch that. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. um, yeah, and, and we, some we people can think see it's that. an extremely serious risk. Other people uh, think that it's not significant risk at all. Just wondering how, I mean, you, oh, you're, a, no, you're no, no, right it's, at it's the a, moment, it's, a, it's, it's not it, the biggest it, issue, but uh, could it be? It's, it's a risk. All, all, all of the methane um, sources that we know exist in the planet um, uh, um, are risks, uh, but the point is that the wetlands are what the scientists call a fast responder. The uh, permafrost, of course, has to be thawed, not the wetlands. The permafrost is emitting all three uh, greenhouse gases. So these are way, way worse than methane hydrate. So we're getting uh, methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide emitted from the permafrost, which, by the way, has tipped the Arctic from a carbon sink to a carbon source. Um, uh, we know that methane hydrates will will erupt for absolute sure. We know that they are. Um, uh, there's little evidence that any of that is getting out into the atmosphere yet, but but it will do. And the methane expert David Archer, the University of Chicago, said that yes, methane hydrate will emit more. It will release more methane as global warming continues. And he said this will continue for hundreds of thousands of years. So we can't, uh, it, it's what I've been saying for, seems like forever. It's all of the Arctic methane sources that we need to approach all together. Mm -hmm. Wetlands, permafrost, and methane hydrate. That's a massive planet destroying carbon bomb. Hey, thanks. Hi, okay, so, um... We're coming very close to the end. I had one person who put up his hand during the course of the meeting, which is Brian Kelly. He's going to come on in a second. At least I've invited him to. I wanted to make two quick observations first. The first is that Seth Klein wrote a book where he was essentially calling for a, a mobilization similar to what we did for World War II. It would need to be, on the other hand, um, worldwide, everybody coming together on the same team. Um, and the other is, 
I can only summarize this by saying, welcome to the Pyrocene epic. Okay, so Brian, are you there? You got I something, am. Got something quick? I have something quick. Uh, I don't know if we're going to answer it, but I want to put it out there. Uh, I couldn't agree more with all of what Peter and the commenters have said. What I want to do, though, is challenge this scientific community that's on this call to get into the politics. Um, in Canada, we have a situation where climate and carbon policy are regularly featured in our headlines. It's Sacrifice very likely God. that our next federal election within the next two years is going to be a climate election. And yet we have the, the opposition party basically denying and discounting all of this. I mean, Mr. Polyevra won't even commit to maintaining Canada's international commitments um, around the Paris Accord. And I fear it's much worse than that. So it's great for us to exchange the latest scientific information, but I want to put it to people and seek Peter's comments. What can we as a group of scientifically oriented people, and mostly old farts, frankly, what can we do to enter into the debate in Canada I'm not here to defend the liberal policies. They they are inadequate, insufficient, and, and too slow, but they're the best we've got at this point. So I personally am quite getting quite active in local uh, national politics. So I want to put that question out there. We We need to take this out of the forum that we're currently in and get it out into the public forum. We need to see scientists responding to the crap that we see in our newspapers and on our airwaves uh, quite regularly. We need to see people challenge the Conservative Party, not just its leader. Um, and I think we need to do what is quite uncomfortable for most, most of us, and that is get political. Yeah, I agree. I, I got a simple answer to that. Um, we need to do what the environmental community was doing decades ago. Yeah. And we need to do what the denial campaign is doing constantly. The denial campaign, and it's organized and orchestrated and out there. And I know for a fact, because I've seen that I've seen their emails um, on at the slightest excuse, they will email right to not just the prime minister or the president. They'll write to all the departments. They're doing this all the time. Um we're not doing it. Um, I don't think we're doing it. Um, so at the slightest chance, we need to be emailing, phoning, faxing, and not just the government, the opposition, all parties. We need to be lobbying, as the fossil fuel industry does, all political parties, right? Um, uh, and we can do this. And um, uh, uh, we have to... Um, but we're only going to do this until people understand how bad the situation is, right? But, yeah, that's what we got to do. We got to get well, political I, in that sense, but I, but I all parties. This. I would offer this. There are a lot of people in KCOR who are doing exactly that. Uh, KCOR itself, as um, a nonprofit organization, can't do it to the extent that we might like, but as individuals, we certainly do. I've written a book about how one can make personal contributions, not just within one's house about changing light bulbs or whatever it might be, but also included in it is um, lobby. Get out there and tell politicians what you want. So it is happening. There are many of us who are active in this area and I think it's gonna become more so. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, uh, intervention, Brian. And thanks again, Peter. We're going to hand it over now to Ted Manning. He's the chairman of the board of directors for KCOR, and he's going to thank you on behalf of the organization. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Peter. That was one of the most exciting ones I've heard for a while. And there's two or three other people who've talked with similarly in the past. I think we could create quite a strong team to be able to set them at the politicians. Uh, we have generally in KCOR or gradually come to the same conclusions that you have or David or Brian just have, 
which is it's, if somebody isn't lobbying, then nobody is. And we actually, as a board, have come to the conclusion that we are prepared to actually lobby. Now we're trying to learn how to do it better. And we actually, at our last general meetings, have come to the conclusion that lobbying on key issues, such as not funding carbon, com carbon companies, or such as supporting other NGOs who are actually grabbing someone by the throat and saying, for God's sake, listen, we are increasingly prone to do that. But once again, we are not, a, up to this point, a, an important lobbying organization. The uh, Climate Emergency uh, Initiative at the Club of Rome internationally is trying to do the same thing. And in fact, there's a meeting next week talking about how the Canadian club and other clubs can uh, weigh in together maybe to do something. And you may have noticed that Andrews Beichmann was here listening to us a little earlier, and he's one of the past presidents of the International Club of Rome. So back to this, what you have stimulated is an increased resolve that we better damn well do something. And uh, we will be calling on people just like you to help us whenever you can, and we can help you. So on that, yeah, and, and that, yeah. you know, I, I, I want, I, I want to pick up on, on, on what you're saying there because, yeah, yeah um, uh, and it's very encouraging. Believe me, it's very encouraging. When I um, uh, found that great statement on the planetary emergency from the Club of Rome, yeah. and and yeah, I, I obviously realize that um, you may be a minority, but your people are doing the right thing. But how about, um, and I'm doing this for the third time now. How about if the Club of Rome generally and all the clubs of Rome write to their national academies or royal societies in Europe and tell the national academies that they need to state that there is a climate emergency which is getting worse and that the science academies need to tell the governments formally to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. That's one simple thing. No. I don't think you will get much opposition from our folks. We already have some uh, public things out. And yes, going further and proselytizing is not a bad idea. So thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to have uh, people working together to try and save the planet, even if we find it a bit of a struggle. So I would thank you all for coming and thank Peter for making a very interesting session again. Uh, and ask everybody, please join our club. We do need enough money to make these things happen. And it's about time to ask you to pay your fees again for next year. And we'll also say we are continuing in the same frame. We have, uh, I noticed he was here a few minutes ago, uh, a chap who's going to be presenting next, uh, next week. Uh, more on the idea of how we actually can make a difference. So we would tell you we're here almost every week. We put the stuff on again on YouTube so that anyone who's missed this wonderful presentation will be able to see it within a few days. And we would ask you again to, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe to us because it will give us a little more visibility and a little better ability to share the interesting things we've learned from other people. So thank you again, Peter. And thank you, everyone. And we will now close this. And anyone wishes to stay around to talk to each other off the, off, uh, the record, we are going to stop recording now. Thank you.